Hi, I hope you're enjoying the readings, um, both the articles and uh, Dreamland. Um, I thought it was a, an appropriate book. It both uh, went into a deep history of uh, the opioid epidemic in America, but it did it in uh, a very uh, interesting way. It looked at uh, the epidemic uh, historically uh, from uh, the history of prescription drugs, uh, the, uh, you, the um, incorporation of uh, some journal articles that were used from medical journals, uh, about, uh, non-addictive tendencies of prescription medication, um, which, of course, we know is not true, uh, and a lot of them were misquoted. We'll talk about them. Um, but it also looks at, uh, the poverty, uh, that a lot of uh, individuals experienced uh, in Mexico uh, that that brought them into uh, the drug trade. Um, reasons uh, that people moved from prescription medication to heroin use. Um, and uh, it just goes into a lot of really interesting details. So I think it makes for a very interesting read and, uh, adds, um, adds a lot to this, to this topic and this class. It's not just a textbook or a, uh, a journal article, a scholarly journal article like the ones I posted. Um, I also thought it added a lot uh, to my basic first lecture, and now I'd like to uh, give you kind of my highlights from uh, Dreamland, and also just point out some of the things that uh, you might want to call attention to, um, or take notice of, uh, that kind of adds to the historical context uh, brought out in in section one uh, that led to uh, the opioid epidemic in the United States and kind of the history of it. Um, here we kind of have uh, in, in the very beginning it it talks about uh, Pfizer and uh, Arthur Sackler and uh, advertising and um, before uh, Sackler uh, most most advertising for uh, medications uh, was pretty straightforward an ad or a brochure or uh, something like that but here we're seeing some really really unique things uh, agents from advertising becoming educated in all of the dynamics uh, of the drug, both the pharmaceutical aspects of a drug, the uh, positive benefits of a drug, what the drug is used to treat. They're educated in uh, the disease uh, of uh, whatever is being treated um, and potential side effects but of course that is limited as much as possible for the sale of the medication but they're able to both give uh, family practitioners and doctors in hospitals and now psychiatrists uh, individual attention of course, they used to also take them on vacations, and uh, a lot of that's been done away with, but um, replacing that, a lot of money t 
today goes to lobbying efforts for pharmaceutical companies uh, with the U.S. government. But um, the uh, the individual attention in marketing was a brand new concept. Another interesting thing is uh, today we call them CEUs, continuing education units or credits, uh, and uh, back then uh, they would actually provide um, a lot of the continuing education uh, for doctors, not only free, but at resorts or banquets or um, something that they would find enjoyable. And of course, uh, not only would they get credit for that, um, but they would also educate them on new treatments uh, for different uh, diseases and of course try to sell their, their pharmaceutical uh, treatments uh, for that as well. Um, so a combination of Purdue and, uh, and Pfizer, uh, advertising and a pharmaceutical company and a whole new method of advertising pharmaceuticals and it didn't begin with opioids it it was it began with a uh, uh, teramycin an antibiotic uh, but it really became a hit with Valium of course one of the very early benzodiazepines also one of the very first pharmaceutical drugs that became a major uh, addiction uh, in the United States. Uh, so I, I really find it troubling uh, that, uh, that they would use things like uh, CME seminars and uh, education and uh, vacations and all kinds of things that doctors saw positively to influence them in this very early uh, drug. Uh, I think that um, a positive drug like, uh, you know, an antibiotic, okay, uh, go ahead and market that if it actually works. Um, but uh, here it says Valium, uh, Valium uh, became the pharmaceutical industry's first hundred million dollar drug and then its first billion dollar drug um, by the mid 70s. Valium was found indeed to be addictive and a street trade grew up around it. Hoffman LaRoche was accused of not warning the drug's addictive potential. Uh, years later, Purdue would put those strategies to use, marketing its new opiate painkiller, OxyContin. Uh, so, little history in, in the advertising world. Um, of course, we know uh, Watson, um, who was really one of the founders in classical conditioning also went into advertising uh, after he was chased out of academia. Uh, so um, it kind of, uh, the book kind of moves back and forth from different topics. It moves from kind of the advertising to uh, the actual history of the drug itself to the drug trade to the effects of the drug uh, in America on uh, individuals uh, through addiction. Um, so the next chapter I wanted to bring up was uh, called the molecule and of course it's the morphine molecule uh, and uh, next week to this week, uh, I'm going to talk about, um, so the second week I'm going to talk about kind of addiction, 
uh, how addiction kind of works with the brain in general, uh, how the cycle of addiction works with opiates, um, and, and next week we'll really get into uh, all of the individual uh, types of opiate addiction um, and begin to talk about treatment and then uh, the fourth week we'll focus solely uh, on uh, medication and treatment and then alternative treatments the last week. Um, but uh, so next week we'll talk more about uh, opiate receptors in our brain and even why they're called opiate receptors and uh, and how uh, various drugs work uh, with those receptors. Um, but uh, here says Andy Coop uh, very nearly spent his career watching paint dry, uh, but instead uh, the University of Bristol uh, was uh, John Lewis who studied chemistry of drugs and addiction in the 1960s. Lewis had discovered uh, buprena, uh, buprena Fiend, an opiate that he later helped develop into a treatment for heroin addicts and uh, then of course um, here we have uh, the morphine molecule makeup what gave the morphine molecule its immense power he said was that it evolved somehow to fit key and lock into the receptors that all mammals especially humans have in their brains and spines the so-called mu mu but uh, in reality, mu uh, is the Greek letter mu. Uh, so here they write it out mu, but normally they would just use the Greek letter mu, uh, opioid receptor. Uh, there's uh, previously they thought three primary uh, receptors were affected. Now they say four uh, receptors are affected, but. Uh, designed to create pleasure sensations when they receive endorphins the body naturally produces uh, were especially welcoming to the morphine molecule so here uh, the body naturally uh, has a reward center uh, so it produces uh, endorphins that do a number of different things they mediate pain they respond uh, to give a reward of a pleasurable feeling um, and uh, they also uh, do things like uh, in the last uh, week I'll talk about oxytocin which was at one time thought to have nothing to do with this but of course we do have uh, that prefix oxy uh, and uh, and now we believe that uh, there is a relationship and I'll talk about that when we talk about alternative treatments um, but uh, these receptors also create a sense of well-being safety uh, they deaden anxiety and worries um, oxytocin uh, is kind of the love uh, hormone um, but here we have endorphins uh, in these receptors especially the mu opioid receptor um, so uh, they're activated and they produce they deaden pain they produce pleasure uh, they give us a sense of well-being and safety and uh, they numb anxiety uh, and other negative feelings um, so that's a big payoff uh, or if it's naturally produced a good reward uh, for whatever generates uh, those endorphins naturally. 
um, such as a positive relationship, sexuality, um, doing a good deed, giving a gift, uh, things like that, um, being praised. Uh, so here we see uh, the receptor combines with endorphins to give us those glowing feelings that say the sight of an infant, the feel of a furry puppy. Um, oxytocin uh, is really found uh, with pregnancy, birth, um, and uh, breastfeeding and bonding with an infant. Uh, also in mating, uh, finding love. Um, the morphine molecule overwhelms the receptor, creating a far more intense euphoria than anything we come upon uh, internally or naturally. Uh, also produces drowsiness, constipation at the end, an end to physical pain. Aspirin had a limit to the amount of pain it could calm. The more morphine you took, Coop said, the more pain was dulled. Uh, and of course, originally, uh, this was derived from uh, the morphine or opium poppy. Uh, a mature poppy's petals would fall away, golf ball bulb sized, golf ball sized bulb emerges, emerges. Uh, they'll take a knife, they'll slice the bulb, squeeze it, um, and uh, a gooey substance would uh, drip out and uh, that of course contained the opium. Um, from opium humans have derived laudanum, uh, opium mixed with alcohol, uh, codeine, uh, thebane. Uh, thebane uh, was one of the early uh, derivatives, uh, and Thebes uh, is the original uh, etymology. A lot of people uh, thought that uh, it was derived in the city of Thebes. Um, so, let's see. Um, hydrocodone, oxymorphone, uh, heroin, of course, um, as well as 200 other drugs and derivatives, all containing the morphine molecule, that original molecule, because that's what fits in to our receptors. Um, so, uh, also used in tranquilizers. You can tranquilize a rhinoceros with it. Most drugs are easily reduced to uh, water-soluble glucose in the human body, which then expels them alone. In nature, the morphine molecule rebelled. It resisted being turned into glucose and stayed in the body. Hence, uh, a long withdrawal uh, period uh, trying to get that out of our systems. Um, so then, uh, talks about the history, uh, the poppy, um, and opium, and it goes back to Assyrians inventing the early methods still widely used today of draining the poppy pod, uh, the Sumerians, the world's first, first civilization and agriculturists used, uh, the ideograms for the poppy, um, there's a book by Martin Booth called Opium, a History that he recommends. Um, so, uh, in Thebes, uh, an Egyptian city, uh, first great center of uh, poppy production and opium production. Early 1800s, German pharmacist's apprentice named Frederick uh, Surturner uh, isolated the sleep-inducing element in opium and named it morphine for Morpheus, the Greek god of sleep and dreams. Morphine uh, was more potent than simple, simple opium and it also uh, numbed more pain 
1853, meanwhile, in Edinburgh, a doctor named Alexander Wood invented the hypodermic needle, delivery system superior to both eating the pills, which would go through our digestive system. Uh, the liver would actually reduce the amount, um, and uh, a delivery system superior to both eating the pills and the then popular anal suppositories, which is actually uh, a direct line uh, to our blood supply. Uh, and um, of course, cocaine uh, also has a more immediate line. It doesn't actually go directly to our brains, but it goes to our lungs, which have more uh, blood vessels, and there's more of a direct line to our uh, our blood supply. Um, so the whole goal uh, is uh, how quickly uh, we can get drugs to the area we want to get them to, whether um, we're prescribing a medication for a chest cold. We want to get those drugs to our lungs. Uh, if we have a stomach uh, problem, we want to get those drugs to our digestive system. If we want to get the drugs to our brains, most likely we want to get them into our blood supply, uh, into our veins, and we also want uh, them to pass through the blood-brain barrier uh, as readily as possible, as easily as possible. Um, so hypodermic needle uh, became uh, the best way to administer uh, this drug. Wood's wife, interestingly enough, became the first recorded overdose death from an injected opiate. Tragedy. Tragic. Um, and then London 1874, Adler Wright was attempting to find a non-addictive form of morphine. This has always been the pursuit of uh, pharmacists and, and scientists to find something that will deaden pain but be non-addictive. Uh, and it's been a very difficult journey, of course, when we're pursuing the morphine molecule. And uh, so he synthesized a drug he called diacetyl morphine, morphine, uh, but um, terrific painkiller, 1898. Bayer Laboratory chemist in Germany, Heinrich Dresser, reproduced rights diacetyl morphine and called it heroin. Um, for heroish, meaning heroic, people would feel heroic uh, when they took it. Um, that is pretty much um, what, what has been used since that time uh, as heroin, as a a processed synthetic. Um, of course, the more uh, synthesized, the more processed, uh, the more pure. Um, but uh, now um, we have fentanyl, we have so many other derivatives and synthetics uh, that are even more potent, and we'll talk about the effects of fentanyl, um, which is causing most of the deaths in the epidemic. Um, and then uh, talks about some of the acts, the Har Harrison uh, Narcotics Tax Act of 1914 begins to regulate uh, narcotics. Um, I just marked a couple other places uh, that I thought were important. Here we have uh, on page 63 um, the first mention of methadone. A uh, painkiller known as methadone was synthesized by scientists in Germany to make Nazi Germany medicinally self-reliant 
as it prepared for war. The Allies took the patent after the war. Eli Lilly Company introduced the drug to the United States in 1947, so immediately after World War II, they took the patent of methadone from Nazi Germany, uh, identified it as a potential aid to heroin addicts. Uh, we still use methadone today. Of course, we've come up with a lot of alternatives to that. Um, the idea was taken up by Dr. Vincent Dole, an addiction specialist at Rockefeller Institute in New York City. Methadone, Dole found, was the only opiate whose addicts did not demand increasing doses every few hours. Instead, they were happy with the same dose once a day, which could carry them through the next 24 hours. Methadone addicts could actually discuss topics unrelated to their addiction. They could carry out a normal day of work, uh, lead a productive life, um, pick up one dose in uh, a safe uh, agency, and, uh, and move on with their day. Um, he believed that uh, rehabilitation was dependent on human relationships, group therapy, 12-step meetings, and the like. But as a last resort, for those who defied all other efforts to kick the habit, methadone, Dole believed, could be the crutch to helping them through life. Um, then, of course, after uh, various conflicts and wars, uh, we had an increase of... Uh, opiate addiction and methadone uh, went into more use in the United States. Um, there was always an argument over whether we should use methadone as an ongoing treatment uh, or as a means uh, to uh, get people or off uh, opiates altogether. So, um, however, one of the problems was uh, they kept reducing the doses of methadone and uh, addicts would then uh, continue to crave the opiate or heroin and uh, they would uh, relapse and go back to using again or they would use methadone in combination with heroin and overdose and uh, so the dose has to be enough that they no longer crave it in the same way for a 24-hour period and until they get that next dose but it also has to be uh, a dose that is low enough so that the individual is able to function normally um, and that might be different for different people based on weight, tolerance, age, metabolism, things like that. I think it was very interesting. There's a chapter called Searching for the Holy Grail. They called uh, one of the things uh, that they created the farm, which was basically uh, a hospital uh, for people who uh, were addicted to uh, many different kinds of drugs, but um, it also involved uh, prison sentences and uh, experimentation um, of different drugs and cures. Um, but uh, CIA at one point experimented with uh, patients at the farm with LSD and it was eventually closed and turned into a regular hospital. But methadone was used extensively and found uh, to work very well for what it was, um, which was a, a substitute but a very manageable and functioning opiate substitution for uh, a heroin addiction. Um, still important uh, that um, 
even though uh, we have this epidemic that all started with um, basically uh, a couple different things uh, this time around. Uh, the landmark study, uh, Dr. Herschel Jick uh, out in Boston, uh, New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, he, he wrote a letter to the journal stating that he found in, in uh, uh, the 90s. Um, so uh, here we have, um, let's see, I want to get you the exact year. Uh, less than 1% uh, statistic uh, stuck. Um, so, oh, so he found much earlier. Uh, let's see. I think his uh, original finding, let's see. Let's author. So, uh, he, he wrote a letter early on uh, to the New England Journal of Medicine um, that became a foundation for kind of a, a revolution that all pain should be treated. Uh, less than 1%, uh, he found that less than 1% of his patients um, were became addicted to uh, opioid treatment uh, for pain. But they were all hospitalized. Um, and uh, they were under very strict supervision. Um, so it was a really a misinterpretation of his letter. His letter really supported a contrary claim that when used in hospitals for acute pain and then uh, when mightily controlled, opiates rarely produce addiction. Nevertheless, its message was transformed into that broad headline, addiction rare in patients treated with narcotics. So this was people who were experiencing operations and cancer or end-of-life issues that he had been dealing with under a very supervised setting. Um, and he did not have a lot of experience with addiction and his patients. However, um, he's not talking about a prescription of pills and patients being sent home with those prescriptions. Um, so uh, here we have um, a lot of people citing his earlier uh, his earlier letter, um, and uh, you know, it's set in a different location in this book. Uh, what the year of year was of his letter? So here we. Okay, so um, here we have uh, one day, 20 years earlier, 1979, a doctor of Boston University, Herschel Jick. So 1979, um, he was using a database uh, that began in the 1970s um, at the Boston Collaborative Drug Surveillance Program included millions of patients and hospital records in four databases. Uh, so then they started uh, quoting this early letter just to get some kind of uh, journal entry about the non-addictive tendencies to sell this medication. And uh, you know, they really misused uh, that quote. Um, and then uh, here we have Purdue once again. Uh, OxyContin 
is a simple pill. It contains only one drug, oxycodone a painkiller that Germans synthesized in 1916 from Thebane, an opium derivative, molecularly, oxycodone uh, is similar to heroin, oxycontin, uh, riffed off an earlier Purdue product, MS cotton. So people are often mispronouncing these drugs. Cotton is just a shortened word of continuous content continuous so it was a it was basically a very early version of a time release um, unfortunately uh, I'm sure they knew this but they said they didn't if you because they put it on a, on a warning do not chew um, because you could get a lethal dose so if you chewed these early time release tablets the time release was due to different layers of coatings in the tablets and the layers would dissolve at different points within our digestive system. So uh, you could have different layers of the tablet being released uh, over a period of time at different times. Uh, and that's how they would get the, the uh, continuous dosage or the time release dosage. Now uh, they coat minuscule uh, amounts with uh, sulfur and um, time release is much more precise now and uh, much less prone to uh, chewing at, for a high. Uh, or euphoria. So it's time release is much, uh, much more effective now. Um, but uh, back then, uh, all you had to do was chew a tablet to get the full effect. It also produced a lot of overdoses. In addition, uh, you could dissolve the tablets and inject them or take the dose all at once that way. Um, so, uh, and then of course we had a lot of different types of uh, medications, everything, uh, mixing various synthetics with aspirin or with Tylenol, acetaminophen, and People would take multiple pills if they were only getting five milligrams, but each pill might have contained 350 milligrams of acetaminophen. If they're taking 10 of those pills, that's a lot of Tylenol. You could overdose on Tylenol. Uh, so a lot of people didn't think about that either. It would cause liver damage, and uh, they weren't thinking about mixtures uh, with acetaminophen or aspirin uh, that was also contained in a lot of the various prescriptions. Um, and as I said before, uh, people would uh, eventually find that uh, the pills were either too expensive or they didn't have access to them. They would move to uh, the illegal uh, substance of heroin and now we find so many things being mixed with that like fentanyl or fentanyl or uh, or other substances or it being a less processed substance like they're talking about in dreamland uh, black tar uh, which is really poorly processed not processed much at all and, um, you know, so uh, I think that uh, that brings us up uh, to the end of section one. I'm sorry section one was such a long section, uh, but we do only have five weeks and uh, books about an inch and a half thick. and. Um, I hope 
uh, my rambling on and my response uh, was okay for you and that I was able to highlight some very specific points uh, of that section for you. Um, hope you're enjoying the book uh, and I'm interested in hearing uh, what you have to think about Dreamland as well.